Well, hey, smart people, your favorite Uncle Matt with you, and welcome to my live stream where you have the opportunity to ask me pretty much anything that's on your mind, and I'll do my best to answer your questions on the fly. So if you have questions about studying or a project you've got coming up, or you just want to talk about something philosophical, I'm happy to answer the questions to the best of my ability. I've also got a short lesson to start out our session. And then towards the end of our time together, I'm going to give you the opportunity to weigh in and tell me what topics you'd like to see me to, uh, to, to cover or to include on my upcoming videos on YouTube. So with all of that being said, I am so happy to have you here. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. And I want to start this session with something that I call the six steps to learning. And when you understand these six steps to learning something, it'll give you tremendous personal power. The first thing that it'll do for you is it will stop you from getting discouraged every time you're trying to learn something new. It'll allow you to understand what the process is so you'll always know where you're at. And you'll know, okay, well, here I am, and all I need to do is such and such, and I can move to the next step. So, but if you don't even know that there's steps, then it gets very frustrating. I'm also going to talk about how I applied this technique in my own life as a parent with my little girl. Now, the other thing that these six steps to learning are going to do for you is it helps you to become incredibly persuasive. You see, it's not just about your ability to learn things. When you're communicating with other people, I'm going to show you the process that they go through so that as you're dealing with their six steps, you'll know where you're at. You'll always know how close you are to gaining agreement on things. So this is some valuable stuff. So if you've got something to take notes with, I certainly encourage it. And so here are the six steps to learning. So step number one is rejection. That is where your mind says, I don't get it. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. Now, your mind will reject new ideas when they're first being presented. Now, everybody does this. The very first time you're being presented with totally new information, it bounces off your head and you reject it. You don't like it. You disagree with it. You want to argue with it. And now if I'm allowed to read some of your thoughts, some of you are saying, oh no, not me, Matt. I, I don't do that. Which only proves my point. <laughs> so the first exposure to brand new information, it doesn't sink in at all. It kind of bounces off your head. The second exposure to that same information, your mind lets it in a little bit before shutting it down. And the, your mind, if, if we were to, to give it a personality, it would say something like, well, maybe that's true, but not for me. Well, I'll grant you that that might be true for somebody else. Girls are just smarter than boys. Well, that Uncle Matt, you know, he's got gray hair, so yeah, that's why he can do it. You know, but, but look at me. Uh, maybe you can do it, but I can't. And that's where excuses tend to pop up. All right. The third exposure to the same idea, the third step to being able to learn something new is it might work. It might work. Then again, it might not. Yeah, it might. But then look at all the reasons that it's not going to happen. You know, I might be able to learn... Um, uh, I might be able to learn to speak a foreign language, or I might be able to learn to play a, a musical instrument. But then, then again, maybe I, maybe I really can't do it. And I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to practice. And I don't need a good teacher. And that's where you start to debate it. By the way, those of you that are in any form of sales, or those of you that are in any form of persuasion, even if it's with your parents or your teacher, or those of you that have kids, this is a very important step. When you hear them debating, well, it might work, and then again, it might not, you are very close to agreement because that is step number four, is agreement. And that's where the light goes on and you say, 
oh, I get it now. I get it. So I'll cover the last two steps with you in a moment, but let's review the first four steps. So step number one, I don't get it. I reject it. I disagree with it. I dislike it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Step number two, well, maybe that's true, but not for me it isn't. Step number three is it might work. And then step number four is the lights go on, bink, I get it now. Step number five is I can do it. Now, you may think that that's the same as getting it or agreeing with it, but it's not. Think about it. When you're in class and the teacher puts some complicated math problem on the board and solves it for you, and you go, oh, I see how it's done, and then you get home to try and do your homework, and you go, how the heck did they do that again? So there's a difference between agreeing with it or getting it and actually being able to do it. And this is important for any physical skill you're learning how to do. It doesn't matter whether you're learning how to cook or learning carpentry or whatever it is, there's a difference between understanding what needs to happen and agreeing with it and actually being able to do it. So that's step number five, I can do it. And step number six, when you have total and complete control over that idea, step number six is I taught it. I taught it. Now you're able to give it away. You see, you cannot give away that which you do not possess or that which you don't have control over. For example, here's my coffee cup. In order for you to give this coffee cup to somebody else, you have to have it first. You have to be in possession of it first. You have to have control over it, but you don't. So you can't give it away. I can. So let's talk about what this does for you when you're learning something new. Let's say you're learning a, a musical instrument or you're learning a foreign language and you're feeling frustrated. What you need to do is to ask yourself, what step am I on? And understand that there are steps. All you need to do is to be persistent to get yourself to the next step. And it gives you the ability to learn anything when you understand what the steps are. So you're, you're learning something new. Uh, it might be uh, uh, in the realm of politics. It might be, like I, like I said earlier, I, I happen to like to use musical instruments as, a, as an example because I've been a working musician for so many decades. So it's something near and dear to my heart and I understand what the process is. So maybe that other great keyboard player can do it, but I can't. However, if I stay with it, I'll go, I'll, I can get to the next step. Hmm, I might be able to do it. I might be able to play that run. I might be able to figure out that chord sequence or, or do that really cool fast arpeggio. But so I just need somebody to show me how. Maybe, maybe I could find it on YouTube. Maybe I, maybe I could find somebody to show me how to do that. So what that does is that when you understand that there's different steps that your mind goes through, it allows you to be in control of the process rather than being a victim. All right. Let's talk about how you use this when you're speaking with somebody else. Have you ever had a situation where, I don't know, you know, uh, I'm married for a long time now. And uh, in the past, I used to have different, uh, different people who were my bosses when I worked for different companies. Well, have you ever had an idea? Maybe you go to your spouse or your kids or your boss and you go, hey, listen, I got a great idea where we can go on vacation or, or where we can go on that company trip. And they shoot you down, but you're persistent with them. And you go, no, I, I really think that this would be a great idea for us to go there for the trip. And if you're persistent long enough, and you find a different way to explain it to them when you come back to them. Have you ever had the experience where they not only agree with you, but they think it was their idea to begin with? <laughs> they take credit for your idea. Show of hands, how many of you can relate to that? 
Uh, it's hard for me to see you from here. But <laughs> you've all had that experience. So I want you to listen, not just to your own thoughts. So there's two voices you need to listen to. The first voice you need to listen to is the voice that's inside of your own head. And you know the voice I'm talking about. We've talked about this before. That's the little voice that when I talk about it, that it says to you, there's no little voice in here. That's the voice. So you need to ask yourself, what am I telling myself when I'm trying to learn this? Am I at total rejection? Maybe it's not for me. It might work. Am I at agreement? Where am I in the process? The second voice you need to listen to is also to listen to other people when you're trying to be persuasive with your idea. Listen to the words they use. Do they say, you're crazy, that's a stupid idea. What step are they on? Right, they're on step number one, rejection. On the other hand, if they say to you, well, listen, you know, that, that, that idea might be good for another company. Yeah, sure, that, that, the, the, the people that live across the street, that would be good for them. That would be good for my sister, my brother. I'm sorry. Maybe that's true, but not for me, it's not. When they start to debate the pros and cons with you, this is step number three, and this is really important. You want to really be paying attention to where they're going. Well, you know what? We might be able to go on a trip there, but we'd have to figure out the hotel accommodations and the airfare and the scheduling and what season. And now they're in the process of debating the pros and cons. It might work. It might not. The very next step is agreement. And that's where you make the sale. So we covered something that I dare say nobody has ever talked with you about before. Now, the chances are good that I'm going to make a separate video on that subject. It's been something I've been planning to do for a while. And I liken it to skipping flat rocks on the lake. And I'm going to close this uh, lesson with this. You've all had the experience where maybe you go to a, a body of water, a lake, a river, a stream, what have you, a pond, and you find a flat rock and you throw it and you skip it on the surface of the water. Well, that's kind of like what we're talking about here because we use the expression that an idea has to sink in. Oh, it hasn't sunk in yet. Oh yeah, I need, to, I need to take a moment and let that sink in. See, we use these expressions, but I, what I do is I kind of uh, 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 dig deeper into why do we say that? Because that's the feeling you get. All right, so let's say that the pond is your mind. And let's say that the flat rock is a brand new idea. And you're the teacher, or you're the salesman, or you're the one presenting the new idea to the mind. All right, so you've got your new idea, and now you, it leaves your hand, and you throw it, but it hasn't hit the water yet. So the teacher has delivered it, the salesman has delivered it, but it hasn't hit the water yet. I don't get it. The lake hasn't gotten it. The, the lake is going on. What are you talking about? There's no, there's no stone here. I reject this idea. Step number two is the stone hits the surface of the water and then bounces out. Maybe, but not for me. Maybe, but not for me. Now, how many skips does it have? You're never quite sure. Well, it might stay in this time or it might have another skip in it. It might work. It might not. So those are the first three steps. Rejection, maybe it might work. Then once it stopped skipping, that stone sinks very quickly into the lake. And so it's got it. The lake got it. There's no doubt that stone is not going to float or fly away. That It's in the lake. And then eventually that stone settles on the very bottom of the lake bed. And over time, 
there's uh, plant life that grows on it. You know, the fish are starting to swim around it. No longer is that stone something foreign to the lake. It has become part of what makes up that lake bed. To go in and take it out would be to disturb the lake. It would be to disturb the lake bed. So that kind of gives you a good um, practical view of what the process looks like. And I hope you found that helpful. All right. So the reason that I give a, a short lesson before, um, before I take questions is because I know that people are not always able to join us right at the, right at the very moment that we get started. And I don't want to leave anybody out of giving them an opportunity to ask questions. Now, I may or may not be able to get to all of your questions, and uh, I don't know how many we've got. So I'm going to go to my partner down in Brazil. And so, Bobby D., would you be our moderator and help us out and uh, tell me, uh, does anybody have a question yet? Yeah, there's several good quest great questions, actually, and some more comments. But let me address B's. She says, ha-ha, my name is actually Anna. So, <laughs> Anna. Yeah, Anna and, Banana. And then, my wife's um, name is Anna. That's true, huh? Yes. All right. Uh, let's start with the question. I'll, I'll attempt to get them in sequence that they came in. Your marriage counselor says or asks any tips on how to take proper notes. I can't seem to figure out what's actually important. All right. So, help me understand the question better. And I'm just going to kind of think out loud here for a moment. Is the problem that you that you don't really know what information to pull out of a book or a lecture? Um, that should be relatively easy. Uh, and the and the way to do it is to look at past exams or look at the quiz at the back of the book because that'll tell you the the quiz at the back of any chapter. If you if you have a textbook that has um, quizzes, not not every textbook does, and not every not every reading book does. Um, and I, I use some of my own books as an example. So depending on the kind of book that you're, that you're dealing with, it may or may not have a quiz at the, at the end. If it does, that makes note taking very simple because now you know what the author of that book thought you were supposed to learn in that chapter. If it's for a class assignment, get copies of past exams. And now you'll know what other people who have taken exams for that course curriculum have thought was the most important stuff that they were going to be tested on. So that helps you segment out what the information is that you're looking for. Now, when you don't have that, you want to go back to your basic questions. Who, what, when, where, how. So if you're doing a book report, so if you're, if you're, doing a, uh, if you're taking notes on a, a story that you're reading, you want to get who, who is, who's it about? What happened? Where are they when it happened? When did it happen? How did it turn out? And th there's two processes that I recommend. So the first thing is put your notes on a dedicated pad. Now, um, for a long time, I would use spiral bound notebooks because it, it's, uh, you, you can't, because the pages are, are locked in, you know, you're not going to just, they're not going to fall out like with a loose leaf notebook or a, an eight and a half by 11 or a, a legal pad. But I just need a lot of room to be able to write at the beginning. So that's the first step. Write out your notes longhand on a pad of, of some sort, excuse me. The next step is to distill those notes down. So some of you call it revising. You want to distill your notes down to questions and answers. I like to create flashcards. Question on the front, answer on the back. And once you've done your note taking twice like this, you write it out on, on, a, on your pad, and then you take your pad and you turn it into flashcards, you'll be amazed. And now, now all you need to do is carry your flashcards with you. You don't even ever need to look at the... Uh, the textbook again. Um, you use your flashcards and it'll give you um, just tremendous amount of recall. I hope that helps. 
Okay, uh, Bobby, what else we got? Yeah, oh, they're, man, they're, they're, like they're rolling in. Uh, Mike Area, you may have answered part of this question, but he, he, he's asking, how should I read for dense academic textbooks and if you would have any tips or techniques on that? Yeah, anytime you've got information that's really dense, the very first thing you need to do is to break it down into chunks. Always remember, by the yard it is hard, by the inch it's a cinch. So when you have really dense information, um, what you're looking for is you're looking for formulas. You're looking for uh, definitions. Those are the two most important things. You're looking for if there's formulas or if there's definitions. Typically, with really dense like scientific or mathematical uh, information, those are the things that you really want to get. And with math, along with the formula, you want to get the concept behind how the formula works. Now, you may not be able to do that simply by reading the book and taking notes. And I've said this in many of my videos, but I want you to, I want you to stay with me on this. Learning does not happen when you put information into your head. So stay with me on this. Remember six steps to a new idea? This, you may be on step one or step two here. Learning does not happen when you're reading and listening to the lecture and putting the information in. That's not where learning happens. Learning only happens when you find a way to get that information to come back out of you. So, with really dense information, with understanding formulas, with understanding the concepts behind formulas, for understanding the, the real nature of how a theory works, the best way to do that is in a study group and talk it out with other people. You're looking for uh, how, how many different ways can you get the information to come out of you. And that's why, that's why you take notes. That's why teachers give you exams, because they want to see how much information went in that's still in there well enough that we can get it back out. Okay, so I hope you found that helpful. All right, Bobby, who's next? Yeah, who's next? Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Um, we got Alyssa. She says, sir, I am having a hard time. What stream should I take? Um, what would you suggest me to do so that I can take the right stream without regretting it later? I hope that stream. you can help me. Help me understand. Okay. That's it. Same Alyssa, thing. I need you, I need, I, Alyssa, I need you to explain to me stream. Are you talking about a career course decision? Um, if you are, Path, it's yeah. like you're reading my mind. If, 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 that, if that's, Alyssa, if that's what we're talking about, it's like, what direction should you go in your life? You know, how, how do you decide what career to have? That. Is, the, is going to be the subject of one of my next videos. As a matter of fact, I've already started writing out the script because I want to talk about my own experience and how I figured out um, what I wanted to do with my life. Um, because I've been all over the map. You know, I don't want to uh, sit here and make you think that I've lived some kind of life where I've always had it all together. I was a big mess. So now I make my mess my message. So I, you know, there's two ways to learn a thing. You can learn by your own mistakes, which is pretty painful, or you can learn from the mistakes of somebody else, like an old dude like me. <laughs> and so um, I'm going to be actually teaching the concept of how do you make these kind of big life decisions about what the direction is, you know, for a career. So um, I can't, it's a little hard for me to read. It's a little blurry. and. Quite frankly, the text is so small, I can't really read it. Um, uh, Bobby, was there any follow-up on that? No, I haven't seen yet. All right. We, we can take Alyssa, the next question. Alyssa, stay with me. Oh. Alyssa, stay with me because I'm going to have a video on the subject of, of, of how I used a very particular technique of making a list of the things that were important to me, but m more important than knowing what is important to you, more important than knowing what's important or what you like. More important is you must know what are the absolute deal breakers in your life. You need to know what you absolutely don't want. Once you, you see, sometimes we don't know what we want because we haven't experienced enough to really know what we want. 
But almost always, we know what we don't want. And that's where you start from. But I'm going to be teaching a little bit more on that subject, um, as I said, in an upcoming video. Okay, Bobby, who else do we have? Uh, roll A1 says, sir, what oh. inspired... You know, you know, you know each other, right? Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. He says, sir, what inspired you to guide students through their path to success? Well, um, chicks, mouse, duck. Um, and let's see, you were somebody else too, but roll. <laughs> okay, so um, I, talk, I talked a lot about it when Bobby interviewed me on uh, the video called Your, My Origin Story. But in a nutshell, um, I got interested in this whole topic of, of teaching people how to learn things fast purely for my own financial gain and my own financial benefit when I was in my early 30s, um, I saw I was in my late 20s now that I think about it, because I got started with this whole thing in um, 1979. I took a job at a chain of computer programming schools in New Jersey. And in 1979, there was no such thing as a personal computer. You know, no, nobody had computers in their home. Nobody. There was no such thing. It wasn't, wouldn't be until August of 1981 when IBM would release its first home computer. And back then, everybody said the same thing. A computer in my home, what would I ever use it for? Sounds ridiculous now, but that's just the way it was in 1981. Uh, my school had a very high dropout rate. That affected me financially because I was paid based on the amount of tuitions we would collect. And so I began to research uh, what makes somebody a good student in order to reduce the dropout rate because I was tired of having my paycheck get dinged. Well, the class that I created, I, 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 I did research on stuff that nobody ever taught me that I know of, how to take notes, how to read a textbook differently than the way you read a novel, how to pay attention, how to listen. Everybody tells you, listen to me. Nobody ever tells you how to do it. They'll tell you how to talk, how to give a speech, but listening is like the most important skill and nobody's, you've probably never taken a class in how to be an excellent listener. And yet about 85% of everything you ever learn is from listening. Makes no sense. That's why I create separate um, information on these subjects. Anyway, so I was doing this back at the computer school. So I not only reduced the dropout rate, I also increase, increased the job placement rate, because when my young adults went out on a job interview, they actually knew what they were talking about and they got the job. But that's when the magic happened, because I began to get calls from the companies who hired my graduates. And they were saying, well, what in the world is making the students at your school so much better than the students at competing schools and better than the students that we've hired from your school before? Well, and my students came up with a nickname for me. They called me Matt the Memory Man because I do these stunts. As a matter of fact, the video that I released yesterday, uh, you'll see that I'm in front of a massive audience. And one of the things I like to do is to try and go around the room and remember everybody's name. Well, on the video that I published yesterday, you'll see whether or not I was able to do it because it's a, it's a crazy number of people. So I would do these stunts, and um, eventually what would happen is once I learned some of these techniques, I went, you know what? This stuff has helped me so much, and there's nobody that I know of that's teaching this stuff. There's people that teach memory skills, but memory is like the last part of the process. You know, that's after you've already got it in, then, you know, sorting it out and then being able to remember it and recall it. That's the last part. You've got to get it and you've got to organize it first. Well, nobody was teaching about note taking or reading this uh, school book, uh, you know, and nobody was teaching about how to pay attention and how to focus and how to concentrate and how to listen. And uh, they weren't teaching any of this stuff. And I went, you know what? I'll bet I could do it. And so I began to do... Um, Stunts. I would be the after-dinner speaker at different 
professional organizations, and I would perform feats of mental power. Eventually, I decided that I could apply this to business because selling is all about exchanging information. When you can get your customer to understand and, and, and absorb the information about whatever that product is well enough that they could see the advantages and the benefits of it, then you can make a sale. And so I ran really large sales forces and produced, you know, uh, I produced big numbers, you know, throughout my career. And so uh, after I decided to leave a traditional business uh, and I accidentally stumbled onto this whole YouTube thing, I said, you know, at my old ass age, I'll bet I can come up with some stuff on YouTube and start teaching this stuff remotely to people around the world. And so I, I dedicated myself to a mission. See, role A1, you're so young, you don't understand the concept of leaving a legacy. You're just getting started in life. When you get to my end of the game, I'm in the, if this was a baseball game, I'd be in the seventh inning. <laughs> and so I'm now looking as to what can I leave behind before my time is up. And so I'm not looking to get paid back. I'm looking to pay it forward. And I hope that helps. Wow, what, do you, what do we have next, Bobby? Lots, but I need to preframe this because, you know, like you mentioned in some other shows, that you, you, know, you have an international audience and um, the pronunciation may be butchered by <laughs> Bobby here. So, uh, but I'm going to take a shot at this. Uh, the question Can is... Can you show me on the screen? Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me go to the screen. Matt. My, 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 yeah. my viewers know that I'm really good it, at learning their names. Yeah, the mantra. It's the, the mantra. Oh, the mantra. I don't, I don't see where we're at. I see okay. Patrick. Oh, right. oh yeah. The, the I see the mantra. The, the mantra. Yeah, okay. The um, he's asking, how do you leave a government job for your other interests? Okay. So, thank you for asking that, because again, we go back to this uh, upcoming video that I've got. And what I'm going to be talking about is how, how do you get clarity on your own thoughts about what you like and what you don't like in your life so that you can put yourself on a more fulfilling path. Um, and so, I'm going to give you... I can't do it in the short amount of time we've got here now because I, I really need to flesh out this idea. It's not, you know, it's not a simple, you know, a, a catchy answer. But there's a process that I can put you through where you'll have the opportunity to, to, to give yourself a good talking to. Now, I always find that an interesting expression because who's the you and who's the yourself that you're talking to? So give yourself a good talking to. So when you start to really dig into that concept, but I want to help you gain clarity on what are your highest priorities. So that this way, if you're fed up with working at a dopey government job, and some people love their government jobs, that's fine. God bless them. But if you don't love yours and you want to do something else, stay tuned because, and maybe what I'll do is I'll move it up in my, um, in my, my plan and I'll, I'll uh, work on it over the weekend and maybe I'll have it out by next Tuesday. Okay, so I've kind of just made, gave myself a goal to see if I can get that video done in time to release next Tuesday, maybe Wednesday. So stay tuned and, uh, uh, stay tuned and we'll see if I'm, I'm able to live up to it. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> All right. Next question. How to leave the mobile phone and study. That comes from Muhammad Ali. Well, absolutely. Listen, you really nailed it. How do you take this thing that is both the most wonderful thing that's ever been invented and at the same time, it's one of the worst distractions in our life. 
because people get addicted to staring at that screen. Well, the bottom line is you simply have to use a little bit of willpower, or in this case, won't power. Turn it off. Or if you're a doctor or a parent that's waiting for an important call from somebody, just at least shut the ringer off and don't leave the screen face up. Put it face down where you can't see it. Put it away from you. Turn the ringer off. Move it away from you. If it buzzes on the table and if it vibrates on the table, you'll hear it. You know, if that's that emergency phone call you were waiting for. But if it's not an emergency, screw it. It ain't that important. <laughs> get, get, get focused on what your what your true priorities are. That's all I can say about that for now. All right, good stuff. I was gonna say just drop it in the toilet. I don't know. <laughs> but, no, don't do that. Yeah, you don't even own a, a uh, cell exactly. phone. Exactly, it's easy for me. No, I refuse <laughs> to own one of those. Anyways, okay, another question from Patrick Stano with the summer oh, holidays. Hey, oh, go ahead. Hey, Patrick. Welcome. Welcome. Patrick is a, a longtime viewer and a frequent um, uh, contributor in comments and posts. So uh, hopefully someday I'm going to get, Patrick and I are going to hopefully meet someday, at least in a, a Zoom call or something. That'd be cool. Anyway, go ahead. What did Patrick ask you? Oh, yeah. Patrick it says, with the summer holidays coming up, uh, let's say you had three months of free time with no strict plans. How would you spend your time? Oh, my word. Patrick. You're, dude, you are like reading my mind because that is really one of the, the subjects that I want to talk about. So the very first thing that you want to do is if you want your life to change, you must start by changing yourself. And the way you change yourself is by changing your thoughts and your experiences. And so, over the summer, you have an opportunity to really engage in a level of personal development. So, what is it that you always fantasized about being able to do? You want to learn how to play guitar? You want to learn how to be a competitive swimmer? Or, you know, or, or maybe for some of you, you don't know how to swim. Maybe you want to go to, a, you know, the community pool and learn how to swim. Maybe you want, maybe this is the time that you want to really begin learning an, another language. Um, at the very least, you want to start reading books that can really have a huge impact on you. One of the videos I'll have coming up soon are some of the, some of the, 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 the books that have made the biggest impact on my life. And very few of them are new books. Um, because th there was a... a, a, a two in particular that were written a good number of years ago that almost every self-help book that's been written since then is derivative of these two books. Number one, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And the story behind that is Napoleon Hill was commissioned as a writer by, the, at that time, the wealthiest man in the world, and he gave him access to interview all of the wealthiest people in the world. Gave him access to being able to talk to all of these other super wealthy people. By the way, it was Andrew Carnegie that, uh, you know, he owned uh, Carnegie Steel and coal mines and all of the railroads and all that. Anyway, so, so this guy, Napoleon Hill, had to figure out how he was going to support himself. And what he did is he wrote down all of the traits that the world's wealthiest people had. What, what was it that they, that they did that raised themselves from abject poverty to being an icon? Think and Grow Rich. All right, the second book is, my, is like my favorite, and that's Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. I've often half-jokingly said, key word, half-joking, that I am the modern incarnation of Dale Carnegie. So one of the things that Dale Carnegie was really big on was, was remembering people's names and how to uh, present yourself in such a way that you're accessible, where rather than putting people off, you're more welcoming. 
what are the what are the personality traits that you can use to um, to connect with more people and uh, and have more influence with them and be more persuasive with them and you know uh, and, and and live a happier life where you're actually giving something. So how to win friends and influence people and maybe in the country where you're from you've heard of the Dale Carnegie program and this is where they, they train speakers they train uh, um, coaches and so a great product a project so those those two books is what I would start with but Patrick engage in a campaign of self-improvement and don't over overwhelm yourself because if you take on too many different things you won't get anything done so if you want to learn how to play guitar and spend three months really focused, let me tell you, by the end of the summer, and I don't know if you play guitar or not, but by the end of the summer, you'll be amazed at how good you play guitar. And let me tell you, if you're a single guy, the chicks will love it. <laughs> and, uh, but, if you, um, but you can do this with, 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 with any project that you have a wish that you said, if I could really improve myself somehow, this is what I'd like to do. Good. Back to you, Ma Bobby. All right. Uh, God, the pronunciation here again. N Natin Kumar Sai. I don't know, but he says, <laughs> hi, Matt. Big fan. I want to ask how to be a good listener. You alluded to that earlier, but how to become a good listener. All right. The importance of it. Huh? Um, I, I actually have a series. I don't have it published right now, but I have a course that I've been looking to release and something I've done live for audiences for a long time called X-ray hearing, how to develop super powerful listening skills. And the reason I call it X-ray hearing is because Superman had X-ray vision that would give him the ability to see things normal people can't see. Super salespeople, super students, super spouses have x-ray hearing that gives them the ability to hear things that the normal ones never do. So there's a process to it, but it all starts with having a, a, a level of focus and you must pay attention. You know, and um, one of the, perhaps one of the most famous things that anybody that's ever been to, to one of my live seminars, as a matter of fact, that's how Bobby knows me, is years ago, um, he used to attend my live seminars in the United States, up in Canada. And so going all the way back to the 1980s and early 90s is how long Bobby and I know each other. And one of the things that I became really famous for talking about is something that my belated little Italian grandmother taught me. Now, Matteo Di Maio is my Italian sounding name. <laughs> and so my grandma taught me in just two words, the secret to being able to learn anything and everything faster and better and remember it forever. And also how to be an excellent listener. So now anytime you can teach something that big and that important and do it in just two words, those are a really two important, those are two important words. It's like a mantra for those of you who know what mantras are. I know a lot of you do. So here is my grandmother's two word mantra on how to learn anything and everything faster and better and remember it forever. Ready? I'll pay attention. <laughs> I'll pay attention. Have you ever met people that are so broke they can't pay attention? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you so the being a good listener starts with paying close attention to what somebody else is saying. And in my course on X-ray hearing, and I may reveal, I may release some of this stuff on YouTube videos. We'll see. Uh, because th this is really an interactive thing. I may wind up doing this on some live streams. Um, but 
as a matter of fact, that I, I, I just got an idea. Maybe I'll do this on some live streams about listening skills. But here is, um, here's what I do. I ask deliberately tricky questions to my live audience. So frequently I train salespeople on this stuff. And so I would ask a, a, a series of questions and then ask these high performance, high income producing, top notch salespeople who are all good listeners, because you can't be a good salesman if you're not a good listener. So I would ask these really high performance people the answers to these questions and almost nobody's able to get it. And then I reveal to them how I trick them. And I call these tricks listening landmines. And there are three listening landmines. And so I, what happens is as I'm teaching this, I put you through a process where I ask you a series of questions, you can't answer, and then, then I show you how I tricked you, and then I move to another series of questions and I ask you, you know, what the answers are, and by the end, I'm able to fool very few people in the audience. Why? Because the, the, um, uh, the focus and the strength of their listening skills have gone to a different level. So I am able to get people to have a, a remarkable improvement while they're still sitting in front of me. Very few speakers are able to do that because everybody's telling you, here's what you're going to do when you leave my seminar and you're out in the real world. Here's what you're going to do later sometime. What I'm able to do is I'm able to get you to be better and have more control over your power right now. But listening skills all start with focus and paying attention. So remember, I'll pay attention. <laughs> Bobby, I think I might have room. Uh, I think I might have time for a few for more. One, maybe two more questions. But, yeah, uh, okay. it's it's ten. It's almost ten of. So it is. Uh, Brandon Williams um, says you hey, taught Brandon. me. You taught me one of the best phrases. Come back to now. Oh. That's a so that you know and reinforces basically I pay attention. You know, I guess right. Okay. Uh, so come. So oh, hold on. Let me. I, I want. I want to elaborate. You want to on that. Okay, elaborate on uh, so, that. So now here's here's what he's talking about. Come back to now. Everybody's talking about how you pay attention to things, and they they don't understand that having the ability to change your focus and to change your level of concentration is a mechanical process. What? Yes. If you understand, if you take charge of the process, then you took charge of the process. You're in control. You're not a victim of the process. So, in my nine-part series, and it's a really old series, it's one of the very first things I ever put up on YouTube when I was first getting started, it's a, a cheesy looking little videos. It's all PowerPoints and I'm talking over the PowerPoints and my mic is not all that great. Great content. I may redo that series sometime, but it's a nine part series called Instant Concentration. How to focus your mind in a world of information overload. And when you're looking to focus on something that you that you're seem to be flighty about, you're going to tell yourself come back to now. You're going to give your subconscious mind, you're going to give yourself the process of, hey, woo, wake up, come back to now. You're here now. You're not off in the future. You're not in the past. Stop being worried. Stop having regret. Stop feeling guilt. Stop wondering about what's going to happen in the future. Be in the present right now. Come back to now, and this is where your power is. So I am so glad that you brought that up. Come back to now. Super important stuff. Okay, next. And uh, all right, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to scroll down because as you will see, um, there's a lot of interaction today. Good stuff from all over. Big comments. People saying thanks for making the stream European friendly. And um, I, I saw that, but I don't remember who wrote it. So my apologies. That's wonderful. But, um, well, the reason right. I'm making it European friendly is because. Bobby D is in Brazil, and and um, and I'm in Florida, and so we've already got kind of an international thing going on. So I want to be as inclusive as I can, and have as many different folks join us from 
from wherever. So thank you for, for uh, bringing that up. I appreciate it. All right, Matt, I'm uh, struggling to find, there's a lot of comments. I'm not gonna go through all the comments, but they're gonna be in the, in the replay chat um, right. uh, on the video, well, you know, people we, will be able we, to read we don't, them. We don't need to worry about any more questions. But we're good, I'm, unless I, I, I- I'll do this again. I'll do this again in two weeks. You so do uh, my, my goal is to start to do these live streams more often. I, I can't tell you folks just how thrilled I am that you all took the time to join me here. You know, I, I, I hope you get a lot out of it, but I want you to know that the best way to learn is to teach. So sometimes you think that I'm the teacher. Well, yeah, I am, but I'm also the student. Because remember, what I told you is that the way you learn stuff is by getting stuff out of you. So when I teach this stuff, I remind myself of these, um, of these ideas that I've got, of these standards that I wanna live up to. You know, I don't wanna be some talking head that just tells you stuff and can't live up to it myself. That's why I published the video that I did yesterday. I hope you go watch it, you know, because you're going to see whether or not I can actually recall the names of just a ridiculous number of people. But at the end of that video, I actually show you how to get much better at remembering people's names. Um, so I, I hope you go take a look at that. And the reason I, I put up a video like that is, yeah, I like to show off. There's no, no secret there. I mean, you can see that I'm very outgoing. I like to show off. But I do it because you've heard the expression, those who can do, those who can't teach. Well, folks, I'm one of those cats that can do both. So for a long time, I was out there doing. And, but at the, as, at the same time I was doing, I also improved my own skills by teaching it. Remember the six steps to learning? I don't get it, maybe, but not for me, it might work agreement. I can do it. I taught it. That's where you have total mastery of the idea. And having you all ask me questions forces me to stay on my game and then to, to really think about what I feel to be true and be able to, to uh, deliver it back to you. So I want to thank you all for joining me here today. This has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the habits of the rabbits go mm. forth and multiply.